Okay, students, uh, welcome to topic um, or option D, your first and only option in IB physics. And this is astrophysics. And to start off, I'm going to talk about uh, section D.1, which, uh, which is called stellar quantities. And I'm going to be uh, in this video, it's, this video is going to be quite descriptive. I'm going to talk about an introduction to the universe, the solar system, and beyond the solar system. And then in the next video, I'll start getting into some more technical aspects of talking about stellar characteristics for the first time. All right. Now, whether or not you've taken an astronomy class ever in your life, you probably know that there are that that we live. Earth is one of eight planets uh, circling the sun, and this whole system is called the solar system. All right. They orbit in ellipses, which we have studied when we talked about Kepler's laws. They all have different planes, meaning that the um, elliptical sort of plane that's, that's traced out by the planets as they go around the sun in one of their years, um, they're all different, they're all sort of different planes. They're all actually slightly tilted at uh, different angles, which I'll talk about in just a minute. They all orbit in the same direction, which is fascinating. Fascinating. Um, all of them except Mercury and Venus have moons, also very interesting. And between Mars and Jupiter is an asteroid belt. And astronomers believe that the asteroid belt is actually the remains of, um, of a planet that never sort of got its act together. This diagram shows you the relative sizes of all the planets, but not their relative distances apart. They're, as you probably know, there's no, they're nowhere near this close together. They're much more spread out in space, okay? Now, speaking of Kepler's laws, you know that planets orbit the sun obeying Kepler's laws. These, uh, their orbits are, we, we, we treat them um, in our calculations of gravitational forces and so forth. We treat the orbits as circles, but they really aren't circles. They're really ellipses that are very, very nearly circles, okay? And as I said before, they all orbit in the same direction, but in different elliptical planes. So you can see how the planes are sort of tilted here of the different planets. Now, planet... Uh, comes from a Greek word for wanderer, and this concept of precession means that when a when a when a planet precesses, it appears to go backwards in the night sky. And if you think about we're on Earth going going in a particular orbit around the sun, uh, Mars, for example, is going in the same direction. But if we get to a certain point in our orbit, it will appear that Mars is actually going backwards because we, we will have sort of, in a way, almost, almost lapped it. You can think of it as going around like a track, in a way. Um, anyway, this table here gives you some relative uh, masses and radii and orbital radius of the orbit right here, orbital radius and the radius of the actual planet right here. So you can pause the video and take a look at some of these, some of these values. Um, you may or may not know that Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus are gaseous planets. Um, and all the other ones, well, Neptune is mostly, uh, mostly gas as well. It's unknown what is actually in the center of Uranus and Neptune, but it's thought that it's, that it's a, solid, a solid rock, okay? All right, so some interesting things about the Earth. Um, hopefully by the time you graduate, you will know what causes the seasons. A lot of people think that the seasons are caused by the Earth being closer or farther away from the sun. That is completely not true. It has to do with the, with the tilt of the Earth on its axis, okay? So for example, in December, um, you can see that sunlight is hitting the southern hemisphere more directly than it is the northern hemisphere. Therefore, it's warmer in the southern hemisphere in December than it is in the northern hemisphere. Go all the way around six months later, of course it takes 12 months to go all the way around the sun, just the opposite is true. It's hotter in the northern, uh, in the northern hemisphere and it's cooler in the southern hemisphere. So that's summer for us being in the northern hemisphere, all right? So you may or may not know this. A couple of interesting things about the Earth. Uh, it's a little over 365 days to go, Earth days to go around the sun. A uh, considerable distance between uh, its furthest point from the sun, its aphelion, and its closest distance to the sun, which is called perihelion. Uh, its mean orbital speed, it's about 30 kilometers per second, and of course we live under 9.81 meters per second squared. We've, you've calculated the escape velocity, you know the albedo, equatorial radius, you know all these before. Interestingly, look at how the equatorial radius and the polar radius are different, and that's because the Earth bulges out at the equator slightly. And its average surface temperature is about 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? All right, a couple of interesting things about the moon. Um, the moon is uh, something that we kind of take for granted. It's quite amazing. There's some pretty amazing things about it. One of the most amazing things is that the moon's apparent um, size in the sky 
is almost exactly equal to the apparent size of the sun in the sky. That's why when we have a solar eclipse, okay, which, which occurs when the moon is in its new phase, when the moon goes between the earth and the sun, um, the moon, the black disk of the moon, pretty much exactly covers up the entire disk of the sun. It's quite an amazing coincidence when you think about it, okay? So from new moon, we go to first quarter, we go to full moon, and during the full moon, um, the earth is opposite, or the moon is opposite, on the opposite side of the earth from the sun, okay? And then the third quarter is here, and then it goes back to new moon, and it takes the, it takes the moon about a little bit less than a month to go all the way around the earth, okay? Now the reason why lunar, this is called a lunar eclipse over here when the, when the moon goes into the earth's shadow, the reason by, why lunar eclipses and solar eclipses, okay, and solar eclipses where the, the earth goes into the moon's shadow, uh, why they don't occur every single month is because, again, the elliptical plane um, of the moon is slightly tilted. Um, so otherwise we would have those occurrences every single month, all right? Okay, so... Uh, it's, here's some data for the moon. So this orbital period is about 27 days. Aphelion uh, is 405,000 kilometers. It's not that far away. Perihelion is 363. That's a significant difference. Check this out. Its mean orbital speed is only about a kilometer per second. That's very slow compared to the Earth. Okay. Surface gravity is about 1.6 meters per second squared. Its escape velocity is correspondingly low. Its albedo is also very, very low. Okay. It's, and that's because it's made of a dark sort of dusty gray material, okay? Surface temperature at the equator, its average maximum. Look at the difference between the minimum and maximum. And this is what happens on an object that has no atmosphere. You get incredibly large variations in um, it, when the sun's shining and when the sun is not shining. And it's apparent magnitude, uh, which is something that we're not really going to talk about too much, but this is very, very, very bright. Okay, the moon is much, much, much bright. It's very, very much, much, much brighter than any star that appears in the sky. You probably know that. Okay, a little bit about the lunar topography. If you notice, you probably recognize the near side. You see it all the time. The far side is very different. And in fact, no one ever even saw the far side until the Apollo missions orbited the moon successfully in the 1960s. And one thing you notice, the difference here, is that the far side is much more heavily cratered than the near side. It appears to be, right? Well, this is because the near side, the rotation of the moon is such that it's only one side points towards the earth at all times, okay? So the far side is less shielded by the earth uh, from meteorites, and therefore a lot more meteorites have hit the far side of the moon than the near side because the earth shields the near side. Pretty amazing. The other thing is that the earth pulls, the gravity is more of an issue on the near side and it's thought that the gravitational pull of the earth has somehow sort of caused, caused some of the craters to sort of flatten out over time, almost a gravitational erosional effect, but that has a much less effect than the fact that the earth tends to shield the moon from, uh, from meteorites, okay? And I already talked about why there isn't a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse every month. And of course, the answer, as I said, is that the moon is actually tilted on its axis, right? And it's very, very far away from the Earth to this scale in this diagram. So well, another question is, lunar, why are lunar eclipses so much more common than solar eclipses? And the reason is because the Earth casts a much larger sh shadow in space. So it's much more likely that the moon will go into that larger shadow then vice versa. The moon casts a relatively small shadow in space, and the likelihood that the Earth is going to go through that small shadow is much, much smaller. Okay? All right. So, uh, lunar landings. Okay? We have a lot of, there have been a lot of successful manned lunar landings. Okay? 11, 12, Apollo's 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, all by the United States, and between the years 1969 and 1972. We have not been back to the moon since then. No human being has been back to the moon. Um, since then, unfortunately, okay? And no other country has landed a human being on the moon at all. So it's sort of an American domain at the moment. So, you know, as, um, as the century progress pro progresses, I hope that more countries will develop the technology to send people to the moon. It would be great to explore the moon. It's really not that far away. And it doesn't take that long to get there, only about four days. So it's definitely within reach of all of us, okay? Okay, so let's get a little bit beyond the solar system. 
this term a light year, which is very commonly misunderstood as being a unit of time. It is not a unit of time. It's the unit of distance. And it's a distance traveled by light in one year. And it turns out that that's about 9.5 9 times 10 to the 15 meters. Okay. All right. And as an example, very, very easy example, you can do this one. Determine the time it takes for light to reach the Earth from the sun in minutes. If you take the average radius of the Earth's orbit to be that. And it turns out to be between 8 and 9 minutes. Okay. So in other words, if the sun were to blow up or, I don't know, uh, go dim or burn out or something would happen to it right now, we wouldn't know for between eight and nine minutes. So, in fact, every time that we look at the sun, we're seeing it as it appeared 8.3 minutes in the past, okay? Now, getting a little bit bigger, these are just, I'm just defining to you different units uh, to make calculations easier when we're dealing with these massive distances, okay? There's a term called the parsec that you need to be familiar with. The abbreviation is PC, and that's the average distance between stars in a galaxy, okay? And it turns out that one, one parsec is about 3 times 10 to the 16 meters. That's really far, and that's about 3.26 light years. So on average, it takes light a little over three years to get from one galaxy to another in the universe, okay? Here's another unit, uh, which is actually much smaller, and that's an astronomical unit, or an, an AU, and that's the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which I said before was about 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters, and it turns out that's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 5 light years, okay? So you would typically use AUs when you're dealing with things in the, in the solar system, and obviously use parsecs when you're dealing with things on a much, much larger scale, okay? All right, so the average distance between galaxies so it ranges from about 10, point, 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th parsecs. Now, the Milky Way galaxy contains about 2 times 10 to the 11 stars, and there are about 1 times 10 to the 11 galaxies in the known universe. Actually, it's much more than this now. Um, with the advent of the Hubble Deep Space Telescope um, exploring the edges of the universe, okay? Now, some of the, some of the nearer stars, uh, in fact, the closest star is called Proxima Centauri, and if you were in a spaceship traveling the speed of light, which is impossible, but if you were, it would take you just over four years to get there. Not very far away, right? Well, it is when you're dealing with speeds that are much, much less than the speed of light, okay? Sirius, which is another sort of, uh, it's a very, very bright star in the sky. It's only about nine uh, light years away, okay? Now, remember how I told you how the, the sun moves relative to the Earth? We see the sun rising in the east and setting in the west. Well, stars do too. After all, the sun is a star. It just happens to be a really close star. Stars do too all the time, but you can only see them at night, okay? And the change in direction of a star from one night to the next because of the change in the Earth's orbit around the sun is less than one degree, okay? Now, your location in the universe, this is kind of uh, bewildering and mind-blowing, okay? Here's the Earth. The Earth is in the solar system. The solar system is in the solar interstellar neighborhood, which occupies this tiny little branch of the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is part of a local galactic group here, which is a whole bunch of other galaxies, which is part of a Virgo supercluster, which is part of a group of lo local, local superclusters, and that makes up the observable universe. So you see, it's just it's absolutely astonishing the scales that we're talking about here, unimaginably big, okay? And it is true that we are but a speck in the universe, okay? Now, I told you that stars, um, stars go around, they rise and set just like the sun does, okay? If you were to um, have a camera pointed at, at the night sky with an open shutter, all night, you would see what are called star trails, okay? And Polaris in the northern hemisphere, the North Star, Polaris, would be roughly at the center, and the stars move from east to west the same as the sun, okay? And the position of the stars change over the year, and that's because the Earth moves around the sun. The Earth's position in the universe actually changes over the course of the year. And obviously the stars are different in the northern and southern hemispheres because you're looking at a different side of the Earth all the time. The relative positions of the stars do not change during the year. In other words, when we see a constellation in the winter, it's the same, it appears to be the same constellation in the summer, and that's because the relative movement uh, of, the, of the Earth around the sun is so infinitesimally small compared to how far apart those stars are that from our point of view, they don't, they don't change position, okay? Okay, celestial sphere and celestial equator, okay? Uh, the celestial equator 
is uh, in the night sky. It's basically, you can imagine it as being a big hollow sphere around the Earth, okay? The north celestial pole is Polaris, and then the celestial equator would be going around the actual equator of the Earth, um, and the north pole would be obviously on the top and the south on the bottom, okay? All right? And it's, it's really interesting to note that in 12,000 years, another star will be the North Star, okay? So the, the axis of rotation of the Earth precesses or kind of goes backwards, basically, and goes back and forth with a period of about 26,000 years, okay? That's amazing. So the fact that it's, that it's 23.5 degrees right now tilted, it's not always like that, okay? All right, star charts. These are really cool. These are, these are charts that are showing, obviously, the relative positions of the stars. Here's the Milky Way, okay? And a kind of a qualitative uh, question I have for you to answer here is that some constellations are not visible in the night sky for the whole year suggests one reason. It's a great IB question. And the reason is that as the Earth orbits the sun, the sun appears to move against the background of stars, but the constellations that appear to be behind the sun cannot be seen because they would appear only during the daytime. Okay, so so some some constellations are visible at constellations are always visible. You could always see they're always there. It's that when the the sunlight um, puts there's so much um, there's so much sunlight in the atmosphere that we can't see the stars, right? But the stars are always there. It's just that the sunlight is sort of blinding us from it. So that's the reason why some appear at night and some appear at day during different times of the year. Okay, a more technical example, which is not anything you can't handle. Okay, example three, number of stars around the sun. Okay, go ahead and try this one on your own and I'll go through it. Okay, so I'm asking about the average population density per cubic light year of stars and galaxies. Okay, draw yourself a big sphere, find the volume. Um, and you find that the average population density is about 9.7 times 10 to the minus 10 to the minus 20, okay? Per cubic light year, that's pretty astonishing. And the ratio of the average population density of stars to the average population density of galaxies is about 3.7 times 10 to the 16. And what this means is that stars are much more common than galaxies, at least in our cosmic neighborhood, which is kind of kind of a pretty mind-blowing thing, okay? Now, star patterns or constellations, that's what all they are. They're just patterns in, this, in the sky that appear to look that way from our point of view. So they played a major role in cultural beliefs and myths for millions of years. For example, the constellation Orion through a telescope looks like this. Maybe you've seen Orion in the night sky, okay? And in mythological form, you can see these three stars in the middle formed, what, uh, formed his belt, and then these stars right here form his sword, and he's kind of like this kind of badass battle hunter guy, right? Orion the hunter. Um, anyway, I really like these these old um, these old constellation like mythological constellation charts. They're really beautiful, and it's a really amazing thing when you think about the imagination of these people to see all these animals and people, um, really amazing things, and then it becomes its own mythological sort of art form. Okay. Uh, one more really interesting astronomy-related image uh, that I want to show you, actually a couple. This is called an analemma, and this traces the position of the sun uh, at its highest point um, uh, around, around uh, during, during the course of a year. Okay? And if you think about what's happening due to the tilt of the Earth's axis, and see 23 and a half, 23 and a half, okay? And think about what the Earth's doing at different times of the year, this will make sense for you, okay? But the one I really want to talk about a little more is this one. This is a map of North American meteorite impact structures, meaning these are all the recorded, um, these are all the areas where geologists have recorded that there's some sort of, uh, in the past, some sort of meteorite impact in North America. And a couple of really interesting things you note here. Well, actually, I want you to, I want you to study this and to think about why this pattern would be. There are a couple of things I want to point out why there are none on the west coast and why there are none in the oceans and we have a way of figuring out whether there's a meteorite impact in the ocean but there are none recorded in the ocean okay and i want you to think about that and we'll talk about that during class uh after you watch this video